holding fast to the gospel. It's an interesting phrase. Let's see what it actually means. Does it mean you have to keep holding on to your gospel understanding in order to keep having eternal life? Objectors to the biblical doctrine of eternal security often maintain the following point of view. We are saved only if we keep in memory what was preached and live the life of faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 2. So, objectors to free grace salvation state that salvation is dependent upon what one does and Consequently, upon the continuance of one's faith, and not simply on what Christ did for one on the cross. Of course, I'm from, well, you walk into a store, you put the money down, which is your faith, and you get whatever you bought. Right? Well, in this case, my faith bought eternal life. You had to keep coming back to the store, keep having Jesus crucified again on the cross? That's good. Let's see. But if you lose your faith or commit any number of acts of sin, aren't those actions and or faithlessness and or and oh and and or faithlessness which have been appropriated by faith alone and Christ alone covered but our, what our Lord did for, for me once for all time at the cross. Of course, once for me, and I like this, all mankind, once for all time at the cross. That's the question. Of course, all you have to do is read 1 John 2, 2. Let's just get a sneak peek of this. Now, this is a key passage there, a verse, actually, 1 John 2, 2, that I don't know how people don't pay uh, more attention to it. We start with 1, 2, 1. My little children, believers, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So they're, they're believers. And we have, we have an advocate if we sin. So can you out -sin the cross? No. It says it right here. Well, go into verse 2. And he himself, Christ himself, is the propitiation for our sins, believer sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. They try to put the elect in there. Yeah, they try to say, but also for those of the whole world of the elect. That's utter nonsense. You don't talk, double talk like that. The whole world. Where, where would you get the whole world is the elect. Because you have to say, and he himself is the propitiation for our, the elect sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world of the elect. That's like trying to uh, buy something on the street, there, a fake brand name. Is this the real brand name? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're not buying the brand name. Christ died for the sins of the whole world, period. Not for ours only, the believers only. There you go. But let's go, move on. Furthermore, the passage in 1 Corinthians does not support a necessary continuance of faith in order to have the promise of eternal life. Why? Because it says, let's see, 1 John 1, 2. 1 John, oh, 1 Corinthians, rather, sorry. Verses 1 and 2. Let's just take a look. Keep looking for hints. Now I make known to you, brethren, believers, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received. It's a done deal. You received it. Why do you have to keep on receiving? You got it. You got the whole thing. In which also you stand. So you're standing on it and you received it. By which also you are saved. You're saved. How many times do you have to say it's permanent? If you hold fast and it's since. By the way, since you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. In other words, Christ really didn't die for the sins of the whole world, or it's all fake. 
How many times do you have to say it's eternally secure? So let's keep on going. So now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast, since you hold fast, which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Let's see if it is a sin. If this passage is stating that you must hold fast to your belief in Christ as Savior, otherwise you will not be stay saved, then the Bible is a contradictory book because many passages clearly teach otherwise. Well, let's just take a look. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace, you have been saved. Actually, literally, is you are saved having been saved. Through faith. And that salvation, because it's neuter, faith is feminine, so it's, and that salvation is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So you don't have to do anything to keep it. You believed it, right? That's not a work. It's just accepting what's been done for you. It's not proactive towards the end. Christ, proactive towards the end, died for the sins of all mankind. All you did is, I'll take it by believing it, accepting it. It is true. Unless he didn't die for the sins of the whole world, or he's a liar, which then become a Buddhist. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Here's another one. I've looked at this lately. What was it? 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. It is a trustworthy statement. If For if we died with him, which... That by implication is we believe, so it's as if we were on the cross paying for our own sins, but Christ paid uh, for them for us, we will also live with him. Is that not eternally secure? If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Okay, that's a problem. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful to his promise to give us eternal life. For he cannot deny himself because we become part of him. We die on the cross with him. We become in Christ. So it's eternally secure. Ten, I like John 10, 28 as well. Even less thinking they have to do there in 10, 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Now, how does he give life to them as a gift? When they believe. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And keep on going. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, and the Father, I and the Father are one. So, a careful examination that we just looked at a number of these passages, however, reveals that this conclusion is not the case. You don't have to hold fast to your belief in Christ as Savior. Otherwise, you won't stay saved. And these verses, we looked at them. You can look at uh, Romans 8, 1, 38 to 39. So the if, now this is key. The if, i got to underline that. In verse 2, first class if in the Greek. What is that? which is best translated as since. You know what? I'm going to retype this. Italics, underline, caps. Since. So if you hold fast, aitachitete, verb, the verb, is in the indicative mood, which means a statement of fact. If, and it is true, since you hold fast to the gospel of salvation, you are indeed saved. This is not to say that one is not saved if one does not hold fast to the faith. That conclusion is not supported here or anywhere else in Scripture. So the passage is best rendered. 
Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you receive, in which you also you stand, by which also you are saved, since, do it again, you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, which means you believed and Christ really didn't die for the sins of the whole world. Because you don't have to do anything other than accept something is true. That's what believing is. Okay? It's not proactive. You accept this too, what he did on the cross. Were you going to go up on the cross and add, well, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pay for some of my own sins. No. The Apostle Paul is thus observing that the brethren in Corinth, the believers, are indeed saved, the evidence of which is confirmed by their holding fast to their faith in Christ as Savior. If holding fast to one's faith in Christ were a requirement of receiving eternal life, then the third class condition should have been chosen by God, the Holy Spirit, for Paul to use in subjunctive conditional mood, future tense. Once one is saved if one subjunctive conditional continues in the faith. doesn't do that, though. It says, since you hold fast. So note that in 1 Corinthians 15, 12, Paul says, some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. In verse 14, he writes, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Ah, but he did rise. In verses 17 to 19, he says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. No. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most pitiable. Oops. Let me correct the spelling there. All right. Are we done with that? I got a little extra time. Let's go back and look at some of those other verses. Because I like Romans 8.1. Take a look. Now, it's a little bit problematical because uh, later manuscripts play games. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you're in Christ because you believe. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man, and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, so Romans 8. Let's take a look. I jumped over to Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no eternal condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us me free from the law of sin and death. So the context of no eternal condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus without any requirement to walk by the Spirit is supported. In Romans chapter 3, we're all individuals who are justified freely, no strings attached, through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, and through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 1 to 5, wherein all believers are baptized, united to Christ, Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, securely united forever with him in eternal life, no longer under eternal condemnation, with no human response requirement in view, such as those as who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it is supported in chapter 7, where one who is a believer is stipulated as belonging to Christ, even while he is captive to the law of sin in his members. Paul says that. Hence, the question posed in verse 724, Who will deliver Paul and all believers from the body of death? Is answered 725, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, with the implication that no believer will ever again face the possibility of eternal condemnation regardless of their walk. The believer is then described in verse 81 as in Christ Jesus, implying that he is no longer under eternal condemnation, with no human response requirement in view, such as walking according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Gotcha? So there you go. Uh, 